Thank you. The video. And away you go. Thank you. It's really nice to be your guest poet, a poet among poets. And this first one is about um, all the Zoom sessions that have helped me and a lot of other people through the lockdown. It's called Zooming In. Dimly or brightly lit, people appear in kitchens or living rooms, upright on chairs or comfortable on sofas. We see a face or two, observe their appearance, scrutinize their domestic space, a book lined wall, fresh flowers, family photographs, or a watercolor slightly askew. We evaluate their personality, their home life, based on decor, lighting, or a glimpse of garden. Oh yes, and we listen intently to their lockdown words. That's the first one. This is, thank you. I tread carefully. At their gate, the cherry she planted is in bloom. Pale petals fall onto a dark path. He tends their garden, lags the tree fern before the frosts, paints the kitchen in the colors she chose, keeps busy. I deliver greetings through the narrow letterbox, regretting this time of lockdown, of isolation, leaving people to grieve alone. I tread carefully around the petals as I leave. This is hand me down, thank you. Or possibly I could have called it make do and mend. Gently, gently, I lower the garment into a bowl of warm soapy water. It is a baby gown, tiny, fragile, once white, with holes and worn places. Missing are small sections of lace, but present are darns and patches, attempts at strengthening the fine cotton. Some places so thin, they are transparent. Who, I wonder, attempted a darn along here with looping stitches in white thread? Who cared enough to repair the gathers at its yoke just there? I think of our throwaway society and I wonder how many infants wore this little nightgown? Over how many years was it repaired? Its pin-tucked bodice reworked. Ripped threads at the hem are brought together a little clumsily. It makes me smile, but it is also sad. Who wore this and when? Are they long dead? Who donated it to the hospice shop where it lay in the bottom of a basket, each item one pound, until I gathered it up? At the till, the assistant asked if I would use it as a duster. How I laughed and smiling said, I'm going to treasure it, look after it. I am fascinated by this fragment of history because it is a mystery. It is now cleaner, whiter, and after careful ironing, it's looking crisp and cared for in the sunshine. <laughs> next one is a piece about um, walking in the country with a group of other people and it's a walk around Petworth which is a place near Chichester full of quaint little streets and very expensive antique shops mm -hmm. but it's a heart smart walk <clears throat> spring in Petworth. There are ten of us today what my husband calls the bobble hat brigade we meet at the library close by a car park where he has dropped me. He drives away to find coffee and a newspaper. Gerald is the leader and we are walking in the Shimmings Valley, known locally as Little Switzerland. We, par we pass terraced houses with gardens, 
and then we are in woodland. We negotiate puddles and lots of mud. We clutch at twigs and tree trunks as we slip and slide on the steep paths. It's fun and feels healthy. The day is fresh and the air is sweet. We've had rain for weeks, but today it's fine and dry. When we're not watching our feet, we notice snowdrops and crocuses and the bright trumpets of daffodils. There are blossom trees, pale flowers on dark wood, almost Japanese. We alarm a group of hefty brown cows crowding along a fence. They lower their heads to observe the smallest of three dogs accompanying us. We clump onwards. It's almost the end of our walk and we call cheery farewells. In the main square, I find my husband in the sunshine, asleep over the newspaper. Spring in Petworth. Thank you. This is really a free poem because um, I was reading a column in the Metro, which is a free newspaper, which is distributed on trains and buses all over the country. And there were messages in this uh, rush our crush column, uh, people wanting to meet others they had only seen on their journeys. And I thought the messages were so sweet and innocent. I have put it together with Sonnet 18, by William Shakespeare. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Bonny lady who gets the 852 train from Liverpool to Sheffield, often wearing a delightful tartan skirt. I can't stop staring at your beautiful, kind face. Seeing you makes my day. Fancy a coffee and a piece of cake. Jim Carey lookalike, Liverpool. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Stunning blonde in gym gear and a Captain America top, who got off at Woolwich Arsenal on Tuesday. I'd love to take you to Nando's. Chris in Kent. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed. Cheeky, cute, black-haired princess who loves her coffee on the Jubilee line. You always look stunning, no matter what time or day. Your smile cheers me up. Coffee sometime. The Professor, London. And every fair from fair sometime declines by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. Slim, mop-haired man at Brentwood who kept staring at me. Fancy a coffee sometime. Girl in a pink dress. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou ownst. Really lovely policeman on a motorbike at the traffic lights at Wembley Park and High Street. I really enjoyed our chat and would like to continue it over a coffee. Ms. Green Jag. Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade when in eternal lines to time thou growst. Twenty-something, naturally beautiful female, wearing black jeans and a black t-shirt and travelling to Kings Park, Glasgow. My heart skipped a beat. I'd love to know your name and share a coffee with you. White chinos. So long as men can breathe, or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Um, have you had enough yet? <laughs> oh. um, 
this is appearances and it's about a lovely girl who comes to my house about every six weeks. Appearances. The day before she comes, I tidy the house, hoover and dust. On the worktop, I place a glass of water and a tray with a plastic bag for the used foils. I draw a chair into the center of the kitchen. At 10 o'clock, she swings in all shiny hair, leggings and boots her kit in a weighty hodl. She's the same age as my daughter and has been doing my hair for years. She remembers how it fell out during my time teaching in special needs at the college. We laugh about it now, now that it has bushed out and recovered. We chat about her little boy and my grandchildren and everything else. She's pouring and mixing the colors that will transform my hair. I haven't seen its natural colour since the first timid highlights I asked for years ago. Before that, it was dark brown. I think some of it still is. In the bathroom, there's the scent of apples and a click as the shampoo bottle lid snaps into place. Tracy massages my head and guides the warm water through my hair. There's a slurp of conditioner smelling of boiled sweets. And my head wrapped in a towel, we return to the kitchen. Her t-shirt smells of fabric conditioner as she leans in to dry my hair and trim my fringe. Almost done. A glance in the mirror, an exchange of coins and notes, and a new date fixed in the calendar. December then, she says, ready for Christmas. And she's off down the garden path, shiny hair swinging. Uh, this, uh, these, the last two are about little trips to Europe we were able to make in the old days before the pandemic. Anyway, this is, I like to watch him. I like to watch him. He's sitting in the sunshine on his bench sitting and smiling, smiling and sitting. Tourists, smelling of coconut oil, lean in to drop coins into his upturned cap. Their near nakedness no longer shocks him. He wears his old suit, whatever the weather. Locals greet him. They know him. They know his lively, lilting music. He's part of the scene on his bench in the sun. He has a repertoire of romantic, wistful tunes. He plays Arrivederci Roma, Funiculi Funicula, and La Bamba. And then it's the theme to love story. The notes rise above the smooth cobble streets, beyond the bundles of electric cables and the loops of wild wiring festooned across buildings. Beyond the terracotta roofscapes, beyond the towers and turrets of this small Portuguese city. The music melds with the chime of church bells and clocks pealing the hours until the thunderous roar of a holiday jet drowns out bells, music, traffic, footsteps, chatter and conversation. Then the Titanic theme spirals into the sunshine my heart will go on and on. A CD underscores his skillful playing. Now it's a jig, insistent, lively. He pauses at intervals, taking the violin from under his chin. Reaching down, he transfers coins to a space out of sight under the purple velvet interior of his violin case. I like to watch him. This is the very last one. <laughs> um, what to tell them in a text home? So much sun, such steep streets, fast fiats, swifter scooters, manic motorbikes. Minibuses career through impossibly narrow alleys and potted palms tremble in dusty doorways. There are blossom trees and spilling over high walls, so many roses. 
Behind peeling shutters, onions and spices are cooking. And in the piazza, smoking earnestly, old men cluster outside the church. So many churches, their discreet doors opening onto cool interiors, fabulously gilded, bronzed and marbled. Here, grand stone lions guard painted Madonnas and tiny signoras bent in prayer, click their rosaries in the candlelight. What to tell them at home? Ah, yes, arrive safely, Sardinia, ciao. Thank you. Uh, you can unmute yourselves, please, if you want, and want to say, well done, Christine. Thank you so much. That was <laughs> oh, lovely. That was oh, lovely. Thank you so much. Very good. Well, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Sue. Is this working? Hello? <laughs> no? That was great, Christine. Thank you so much. Um, I love it. Thank since you are. Am I, I on now? Oh, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> Unmute. Yes, you're, you're, here I am. Thank you so much, Christine. I loved your work. It's just so different. I just, I just yeah. loved every form that you tried to use. I just, it's just hilarious about the uh, people uh, seeing each other in public transit. Um, I used yes. to have that experience yeah, that in New York. Uh -huh. You know, when I lived in New York and I was always on buses and, and subways, out here, of course, it's very isolated. We're all sitting alone in our cars. And I really miss that interaction a lot. Um, but anyway, it, it's just so charming that they've actually got a, a place in this paper for people to put these messages to each other. I, I just love it. I've never heard of such a thing. No. <laughs> Thank you, though, for all of it. It was just wonderful. Thank you. That's great. Cheers. Thank you. Karen, hi. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. I really enjoyed that. You, you, you observe everything so beautifully. Who's that? Who's that? Who's that? I can't uh, see that. It's Karen. It's Kaza. 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 Oh, Sorry. Kaza, <laughs> Elaine was asking earlier, what's happened to Wheezy? Do you know? Is she okay? Yes. Uh, last I heard. I think I'll send her a text real quickly. Yeah. She was she there last time? I know I had to miss last time. No, she wasn't. No, she's missed the last two. So tell her we miss her. Okay. Yes. So cool. quickly something. Okay, guys. So we'll um, we'll get going on the open mic. So I hope you've all got um, something ready to read. And we'll try. I'm going to try and uh, pin you to the centre of the screen um, when you read, every time you read. So we'll see how that works. Um, we'll give it a go. So I'm going to ask you, as you know, in random order and um, ask you, I'm going to mute everybody now. Um, and then when I ask you to read, invite you to read, you can unmute yourself and read us whatever you have brought. So I'm going to mute you all now. Um, you are now muted. And I'd like to start, I think let's start tonight with Holly. Oh, Yes, it's always a shock, isn't it, when I do that? I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> so meet yourself, okay. Holly, and uh, let's go. Um, okay. Um, well, I just want to say again, I enjoyed all of those, Christine. Thank you very much, especially the one juxtapositioned with Shakespeare. It was yeah. very neat. Um, so I'm just going to read a little poem for you. Um, I'll, I'll get it up on my word so if I'm not looking directly at the camera please forgive me I just didn't have time to print it out it's um so it's called the blackbird and the worm I'll just turn my heat off it's called the blackbird and the worm okay stands the blackbird on the lawn at the very break of dawn concerned with neither you nor me. It's listening for things we cannot see. I hear you ask, and what is that? This squirmy thing, so thin and fat. Worms of every shape and sort. Some are long and some are short, squirming in the ground below. But little do they know that soon with terror plunging deep, comes the mighty blackbird's beak. The tug of war does then begin. Alas, the blackbird's shorter wing, 
Below the worms let forth their cries, the brown earth hides them from our eyes. Tis only when with final tug that from this dampened base they dug. Now, wriggling on the ground they lie, the blackbird stands triumphant by a bright and gleam within its eye. And then, with sudden move of fright, the worm it gobbles from our sight. <laughs> Lovely. That's cute. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, now, I think while you were speaking, I think we've been joined by Wheezy. Wheezy. I can't hear you, darling. I forgot. I'm, okay. oh, I'm unmuted, right? Yeah, you're all right now. We can hear you. Well, we hope we didn't wake yeah, you up. Karen, Karen just reminded me. Happy to see you all. Great to see you. Thank you for joining. Uh, okay, Weezy, I hope you can find something to read for us in a, in a while. Uh, not sure. <laughs> well, you just, yeah, I think, I think we have woken her up actually, everybody. Uh, next up, please, let's, let's invite Dennis. Dennis, I'm inviting you, please unmute yourself and in your own time, take it away. This poem is called Growing Old, author is unknown. Old age is golden, so I've heard said, but sometimes I wonder as I crawl into bed with my ears in a drawer, my teeth in a cup, my eyes on the table until I wake up. As sleep dims my vision, I say to myself, is there anything else I should lay on the shelf? How do I know my youth is all spent? My get up and go has got up and went. But in spite of it all, I'm able to grin and think of the places my get up has been. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, right, I'll just unpin you. We'll go back to the gallery. Um, okay, lovely, thank you. I think next up, let's go with Lydia, please. Lydia, would you like to unmute yourself? Thanks, Ken. There she is. Where are you, Claire? Um, I spent a night in a shepherd's hut uh, not far from Petworth, actually, a few weeks ago. And this is about uh, that tonight, and it's called The Space Between. This is the space between owl cry and bird song. Velvet silence cloaks the land. After moonset, the pre-dawn dark breathes as loud as heartbeat drumming in ears. This is the space between owl call and blackbird. Silence startles me awake. Singing blood pounds in anti-crepuscular darkness. This is the space between owl shriek and pheasant whir. The rain and wind have stilled. Before day breaks, the silence is loudest. <laughs> Lovely. That was great. Thank you. Um, so what's it like in a shepherd's hut then? Is there much room? There, there was enough room. I could stand up. Yeah. Um, flipping freezing at 5am though. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Um, okay, thank you for that. Um, next up, please, let's go with Sue. Can you unmute yourself, Sue, and let's um, let's go. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you all. You too. Um, I wrote this on the 30th of October um, this year because it's a year since I finished um, radiotherapy for throat cancer. So I wanted to um, write about it, so I did. It's called Anniversary. 
what a year it's been for everyone to live through. And it's been especially adventurous for me. I finished treatment a year ago today, a wash with the radiotherapy. And the build-up keeps on working for months. I don't know if you know that, but it does. And then you want to believe it's all over after those six weeks of day after day. But no, with treatment complete, the hard work started. How long will my recovery take? We can't say. Well, I suppose everybody is different. Um, but as the endless days melded together, I grew much thinner, wasting away over time. I couldn't eat a grape, sloppy soup, or even ice cream with no saliva or digestive enzyme. And being mostly vegan, intolerant to milk, it was difficult to find foods that would suit. I often panicked at the thought of eating a meal. It was even hard to just nibble at fruit. And the mucus, well, that was sticky and stringy, so much more than you would ever expect. I spent the dark evenings in bed and I stayed there. It was hard now, I think back in retrospect. So I be became reliant on family and a feeding tube for my dinner. I was grateful for friends and that same tube for my tea. And the boxes of liquid food kept on coming as I inched healing forward with each calorie. And I liberated myself from that bully the tube. Mid-November, sipping soup, watching a film on TV. And although then it was scary with no backup for food, it meant my body was totally reliant on me. So I just had to eat. And now, well, today, I bless my body for its slimy saliva. Welcome new glands and an improved sense of taste. My energy and joy de vivre are returning. And most foods no longer resemble chalky wallpaper paste. So to all those with all sorts of throat and other cancers, I send you healing and a suggestion to rest. It's a blip, but you'll eventually get through it. And the brutal side effects are a mind-body stress test. Is everything back to normal for me now? Well, no, but I'm glad to report huge improvements. I've moved from just coping to I feel good today. Then relief of a recent all clear put pay to my fear and I can eat pad thai again. And that's more than okay. It's hooray. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Um, next, uh, Kaza, let's have you please. On you said Kaza? Yeah. Do you say Kaza, right? I did say Kaza, yeah, that would be you, right? Well, Sue, I'm glad to hear that you're you're doing so much better. That that's wonderful that, that you've gone through all that and come out the other end doing well. Um, and uh, I, I just want to say, Holly, I you know you can write poetry about anything, but I've never heard one written about a worm before. <laughs> so, <laughs> well done. And staying in a shepherd's hut, Lydia. I mean. We, where can we do that in America? I don't <laughs> <laughs> Only in England. Well, some other places too, but not in America. Uh, but that was lovely too. Very lovely. Um, okay, my, my poem is written about my sister who just turned 65 and was down for a visit uh, in October. It's called uh, Hands of Love and Determination. You've done a good job with your life my sister tells me as we walk along the beach, married as I am for nearly 40 years and living in a breezy coastal town with work I can do from home. That night, I watch her play our piano. A single light behind her casts a shadow on her hands as they direct the keys. Her fingers weave between them the ebonies and ivories entreated, caressed. In the room's half light, her weathered hands assert their strength, 
testify to her endurance and vitality. With reverence, she bows and bends to the notes that give form to her history, her life's highs and lows. That life has been a bold, tenacious one. Divorced 20 years ago, she took the road with obstacles strewn in every direction, filling up with all the metal needed to keep her children in the home they loved. She used those hands to grip her steering wheel, driving from class to class, college to college, off times from early morn to late at night, teaching music and piano, determined to make a way to get through no matter what. 14 years ago, those fingers clutched her purse when someone tried to snatch it in a Target parking lot. My sister held on even as the struggle turned violent, her head gashed and bloodied by walloping ringed fists. This summer, those hands grasped slender walking poles as she ascended Mount Whitney's rocky path. On the sixth day near its peak, she had to pause. Her body craving oxygen required to advance. In desperation, she gasped and heaved, stopping every 15 paces for the scarce and precious molecules, no longer feeling the pain in her hip. Her son, alarmed, looked on with genuine concern. Worried she might not make it to the summit, he told her, you don't have to go all the way to the top. I laughed when she told me to think this woman would ever give up. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay. Uh, I think I'll do one if you don't mind. Uh, okay. So I'm going to do, I wrote this a long time ago, actually, um, I realize. And you may, some of you may have heard it before. Anyway, I apologize if you have. So it's called Track Marks. Sun and wind and rain have etched your face. More lines than the London Underground, you told me once. Each track tells a story as a smile spills in gentle rivulets from, about, uh, from around your eyes. I'd call them laughter lines if you'd let me, but you always said nothing could be that funny. It only goes to show that every face would reveal a novel if only we could learn to read between the lines. Thank you. Okay. Bill? I mean, excuse me, Ken. <laughs> same what? Same thing. <laughs> Thanks, Weezy. I decided I decided I'll let you guys dive into my childhood just for a moment with this poem. Oh, you've got one. I've got one. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Well, if you want to go now, you can go now, Weezy. Let's go. Okay. Do All it. Right. Um, for you Brits out there, um, Americans had a had an ambrosia piece of, of uh, wonderful food in the 40s and 50s called Wonder Bread. And this is partially about that food. Okay, it's called 29 Precious Days Left. Two foster kids, age seven and four, late afternoon, July 1948. Hot Nebraska winds are still, afternoon sun, simmers low as ins insects hang silent. Gypsy moths swing tangled in weeping willows, low enough to tickle noses. 
Past a grazing herd of buffalo, our arms reach through barbed wire to feel a tail, a tongue, some fur. Sure close enough to smell. Wave by, continue our dusty walk to Shady Bend store. Judy and I hike to secure our daily loaf of wonder bread. Barefoot, leather tough, deeply tanned, hair sun streaked blonde. Brown little Indians, we don't look like city kids, but we are. Our soft squishy bread now wrapped in brown paper, twine handle easy to twirl. We skip home through acres of swaying wheat and cornfields among uh, high stalks of corn. Mud rises through our toes after last night's rain. Cow pastures moo in our ears as the black and whites ramble up the hill, just past the rail, the train tracks by an abandoned rail car where our handyman sleeps among the sunflowers and weeds. Now the farmhouse in sight, mittens our dog snoozes on the wraparound porch, lazy and inviting, rockers sway slow in the breeze, tattered screen door squeaks up three steps to a 20 styles kitchen, old water pump at the sink. Pitcher of well water poured, supper waits promptly at six. I almost gave up on you kids, Udi peered over her bifocals. Table set for four, mismatched plates, wonder bread now on, on stack chip platter. Hand churned butter, homemade strawberry jam, watermelon drips sweet. Buddy and Ed, our foster parents, signal time to bow heads. The four of us hold hands, take a deep breath, eyes close. Judy nudges, Wheezy, it's your turn to say grace. As the familiar prayer tumbles forth, my thoughts go to the train, over the tracks we just passed to the train that always, always takes this love away to a different life, to latch keys to my mother. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Wheezy. Thank you very yeah. much. Uh, and just to say to Nigel, welcome. Good to see you, Nigel. Hi. Um, okay, next up, please, Dan. Can you unmute yourself, Dan, and uh, we'll take it away. OK, so um, I wrote a poem about some issues I have um, with my mum. I read this to a few people the other day, and um, they actually reminded me that um, Philip Larkin had written a similar one. Um, and uh, yeah, he, he didn't. Perhaps put it as he used some rather forceful words, which were quite entertaining. But I was quite pleased that I had a similar, uh, similar theme. So, any rate, I shall. Uh, it's called the debt and duty. Before the cord was even cut, my debt to you was ringing in the till. Childhood crippled with hinted responsibilities. The subtext clear. I bought you life, you owe me forever. Toxic baggage no one should carry. I love you, but I owe you nothing. Chained with dutiful expectation, I can measure, I cannot measure up to your warped demands of loyalty. Perpetual gratitude for mere existence. This debt will be written off, the balance sheet reduced to zero. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Um, okay. So who now shall we go to? Bonnie, I think we'll go to you. Where are you? I'm on my screen. Here I am. I see you. I, okay. Am I on? Is this yep. working? Yep. Okay. You're in. You're right. So, uh, yeah, I've been thinking a lot about time, the issue of time. 
Um, and it brought to mind um, a book that my, my husband had read a long time ago. I think it was the title uh, that brought on this memory. It's called Time and the Art of Living. Uh, it came out quite a while ago, I think in the 80s. And it's by someone named Robert Gruden. It's a series of little essays on how time seems to uh, exist in different ways, depending on what we're doing. Anyway, so my poem is called Time, and it starts with an excerpt from Shakespeare that I actually stole from, from this guy. He's the one that found the quote, so I attribute it to both of them. How sour sweet music is when time is broke and no proportion kept. So is it in the music of men's lives. I wasted time, and now doth time waste me. That's from Richard II. Uh, as quoted by, by Robert Green. I remember my father saying that time moved faster the older you got. How true this sounds to me today. Is this just the nature of time as we grow older and know that however much we have left, it is a certainty that it is far less than what, than what lies behind us? Has the pandemic exacerbated the sped up rhythm of our days and weeks? because we've been traveling and visiting other people and places less than before for fear of contagion. The last cross country trip I took to see my family was in January, 2020. By the time I returned, the fear had begun to set in as more of us realized the pandemic would reach us here and not stay confined to China, Italy, or the rest of Europe. How before the vaccines arrived, we were even afraid to go to the grocery store or pharmacy and eat in any restaurants that were still open. Cooking, ordering takeout, and delivery services were our only option. As our libraries, theaters, gyms, and concert halls were closed, my beloved house began to feel like a prison. Even today, fully vaccinated, I'm still afraid to fly or stay in a hotel. Is it the lack of variety in our daily lives that has sped up time? So when Monday comes, quickly followed by Tuesday, the rest of the week seems to disappear. And it's Friday morning with its rumbling trash trucks mo moving down the street, collecting the bins in front of our houses. On Friday night, I set the table for Shabbat dinner and scrape the remnants from last week's candles out of our candlesticks to make room for fresh ones. I feel like I just did this yesterday. Then it's Saturday morning and I'm calling my husband's favorite donut shop at the farmer's market in LA to reserve a few of his favorites so they won't be sold out by the time we get there. Sunday, we're usually at home catching up on chores, paperwork, or watching sports and CNN specials on TV. Monday morning arrives too soon to repeat this rapid cycle again. All the while, I'm watching the calendar because in my late seventies, I know my time is running out, that I can count the number of Thanksgivings, Hanukkahs and New Year's Eves on the fingers of less than my two hands. When I look back at all of the schools, careers, friends, lovers I've had, the places I've lived and the privilege of having born a child in middle age, I realize I've had a very full life for which I should be grateful, but I'm not ready for it to be over as soon as it probably will be. My mother certainly wasn't ready when her time came. I was with her when she died after a five month battle with sudden onset leukemia, which took her down in five months. On her deathbed, she lamented that she'd not yet traveled to all of the places she'd like to have seen. And when we asked her which, she replied, Japan, Perhaps her trip to China when she was 80 had whetted her desire to see more of Asia. Disappointed and angry, she fought to the end. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, thank you. Um, okay, back to gallery view. And next up, it's Tina. Tina, please, unmute. Hello. Sorry, I was just typing a um, comment to Bonnie because that was amazing. <laughs> wow. Um, so this is one of my fairy tale narrative poems. 
I'm starting to think about winter now. Um, I think I'm one of the few people who loves winter. I think it's really romantic and reminiscent and I just love it. So this is called The Princess and the Goblin. It's a winter's fairy tale of lost love. I hope it's not too long, okay. <laughs> the goblin watched the princess, admired her from afar. She walked lightly through the woods. Her smile shone like a star. He loved her from a distance, dared not to go too near, did not dream she'd love him back. His heart was timid and full of fear. He left her little presents, a feather, a shell, a rose. He watched her as she held the flower sweetly to her nose. He thought she could not see him, but she was watching too. Next time he placed a present, she was there and said, thank you. She told him that she loved him, held him warmly in her heart, had a weakness for small goblins, found him cute right from the start. He could not quite believe her, felt uneasy, even scared. Love was easier from a distance when feelings were not shared. Has no one ever loved you? She asked him outright one day. He thought he was not worthy, but that was difficult to say. He felt that she would leave him, as a princess surely would. When she said her love had deepened, he wondered how it could. <laughs> Each day the princess waited for him to love her equally and well. Her goblin sat in silence and shrank into his shell. He cared but had to hold back, built up a cold and hard brick wall. The princess felt distraught. Did he not love her at all? She asked about his feelings. Why did he hide his heart? She looked so sad, wept loudly. Why was love different at the start? The goblin was so frightened, still did not know what to say. He could not love her fully. She would surely leave one day. The princess cried so hard, her heart melted to the ground. The, jo the goblin tried to save her, but tears swirled and then she drowned. If you're walking through that woodland on a starry winter's night, the lake sounds as though it's weeping beside the small statue on the right. The lake is filled with tears and heartbreak. The goblin was left desolate, lost, alone. His heart became so hard, so cold and hard, it finally turned him into stone. <laughs> Sorry, it's very sad. <laughs> Sorry if I depressed you all. Thank you. No, that's great. Thank you, Tina. That's <laughs> lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, Elaine, it's you. Hello, everybody. Um, my poem is about Pompeii. It's called The Man with the Green Arms. They fell with their wealth. A man whose heavy gold bracelets turned his bone to verdigris in the heat. A young woman of 20 clutching a bag of coins worth $10,000. Her hand mirror and chandelier earrings that tinkled in the wind, the rich sheltering on one side of the cave, slaves on the other. For slaves, of course, it was death to flee. Yep, some did, I hope. I hope that some of the animals also broke their tethers and fled at feeling Vesuvius rumble not taking for granted the plume of steam boiling 20 miles up, as did the sated populace thinking it was a day like any other, just another day of itinerant rumbling from the mountain. A fine August day, the sheen of paradise in the markets full of pomegranate and quince and pear in this port city exporting garum to all points of empire, rotting fish guts, its rich savory, and purple dyes from a snail's mucus. A happy day without portent, Vesuvius never having erupted in Rome's lifetime, and no word in Latin existing for volcano, no word 
to trip the brain, to say, leave now, leave as fast as you can. Family, animals, friends, slaves, take all and go, go now, go. Go before the pebbles and rocks fall, the roofs cave in, ash sears your lungs and cement seals them. Go, escape history. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. <clears throat> um, okay, uh, I think it's up to Mike to bring it home. Mike, I think you're up. Hello. Hello. Um, thank you, um, Elaine. That was very powerful. Um, and thank you, everybody, for your wonderful words this evening, um, especially Christine. Thank you so much for your featured reading. It was really, really lovely. Um, I love having these featured readings because we those of us who gather regularly, we get little snippets of each other. And then for 20 minutes or so, we can really hear um, the unique voice of, of, of each featured reader. Um, and I think it's lovely how um, there is there does seem to be a flavor to, to each of us as writers. And and I love there's, there's a real preciousness about um, uh, your observations that you capture, Christine. I thought they were really, really beautiful. So thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm going to read. Um, uh, hang on a moment, something, um, let's find it. Um, so this is actually five short poems, um, that I think I might do at the Festival of Light in December, but I'm not sure. Um, and it's, I've just called it Five Lights. So I, um, it was Diwali recently, and I don't know much about the festival at all, but I looked it up and I think it runs for five days. Um, and you know, I've been thinking, I, I like the theme of light and dark anyway. I think it's a brilliant, uh, you know, uh, metaphor. Um, and, um, and so I, for five days, I wrote a, a short poem about light. Um, so here they are, uh, it's called Five Lights. Light number one, Diwali, new moon, 4th of November, 2021, night light. Incapable of holding on a moment longer, night falls around us, deadening the carpet of still, sudden thrum. Here we are together, sparks in the stark of night, hearts ablaze as one. Light number two, bonfire night, 5th of November, 2021. Explosions. Hot breath in cold air, cold hands in warm pockets. Warm heart in dark night, dark light in fire rockets. Turns out burning bright isn't all it was crackered up to be, and yet sometimes the only thing to do is to put it all on the bonfire eat a toffee apple and let flames dance in your eyes. Light number three, 6th of November, 2021, news from Sierra Leone. Fire sleeks in street. I cannot write in flame, but if I did, tongues would scream such horror, none could bear to look or know what it might mean. Light number four, 7th of November, 2021. Beacon. Darts into the driveway, through the open window, into the machinery, out of the speakers, bounces off the walls and into my feet that will not stop dancing to the beat of light pulsing in a vein of pure celebration. Light number five, 8th of November, 2021. There is a light. It won't die. I try to let it, but kick or cry or fall or shout, it just won't go out. 
even in the still of dark, you shine while my heart sleeps. And that's it. Thank you, Mike. Right. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Mike. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, everybody. So as Mike said, um, thank you all so much <clears throat> for logging in, for, for joining us. Thank you for sharing your words. Christine, in particular, thank you so much for being our featured reader. Um, it was lovely to hear you, lovely to hear your voice, lovely to hear your words. So thank you all so much. Um, I would just finish with um, a reminder that um, on our website, um, and I hope you do check in on our website from time to time, which is wordsoutloud.org.uk. On our website, we are still accepting um, through the email inquiries at, uh, we're still accepting entries for the blog. Um, I know that they, <coughs> they may sometimes sit for a while before they appear on the website, but we will read them, check them, and we're anxious still to see what you are thinking about. And if you have something that you'd like to share with us, um, send it to inquiries and it could well end up on the blog post, as a blog post on our blog page. So I would just add that. Um, and that's it. That's, that's it for everybody, from everybody. Thank you. Um, wonderful to see you. Happy Hanukkah. Those of you I'm not going to see before Hanukkah starts at the end of the month. Um, so love to you all. I, yes, I just want to say, <coughs> as usual, I've screwed this thing up. Mike, I just wanted to give you a compliment and somehow it ended up going to Denny, whose work I also love, but I meant it for you. <laughs> <laughs> just want you to know on the chat, it went to her. <laughs> but thank you. It was wonderful, wonderful collection you read. Thank you. Well, thanks, everyone. It's so nice to do this. And I think actually, in a way, Words Out Loud was an inspired choice of name. We were our first, we'll let you into a little secret, our first um, go, it, it was Words Aloud, um, because we like the double pun, you know, Words Aloud, and they are allowed. <coughs> we thought it was a bit too close to Girls Aloud, which is a rock band or pop band. Um, but um, so I think what is interesting about this is that you know, as writers, whether it's poetry or whether it's songs or whether it's um, prose or just diary entries, that something does happen when the words come out, <laughs> you know, um, and, you know, yes, it's cathartic, it's therapeutic, but also I think in the act of sharing them, <coughs> there is this process of transformation and alchemy and, you know, so thank you everybody for sharing such wonderful um, experiences tonight. And, um, Mike, what you're trying to say is it becomes art. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So we take it's some... internal, and a lot yeah. of it it's heartache and sorrow and whatever yes. or joy, and it it goes out to the world and it's it is transform transformed. It becomes art. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that, yeah. that that actually when the words or the feelings or the experiences stay down there, they stay inside. I think that's not so um, helpful as probably most of us know. <laughs> so, uh... oh, it's my agent on the phone. Just to yeah, get that, Karen. Really. <laughs> I'm not available. Tell them not from five thousand dollars. I don't get out of bed for five thousand. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Lovely to see you, and we'll see you when we next see you. Some of you in person, some of you on Zoom. Uh, have a great. Rest of day in California, rest uh, of week, everything. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Ken, I'm sorry, I wasn't listening. I was thinking of something else. Did you say we will not be meeting next month? I did not say that. Oh, we okay. will be meeting next month. <laughs> okay, good. All right. And there will be Thank a reminder you. email, which you will get. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> Wheezy, there'll Bye, be a everybody. special one for you, so you don't forget. <laughs> Looking forward to hearing how your uh, workshop goes. In, yes, uh, yeah, well, you uh, will hear, Kaz. You will hear about that. We'll let great. You know. All That's right, my dears. So, right. for it. Lovely, thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bon voyage, Sue. <laughs> right, have a lovely time, Sue. God bless. <laughs> Bye, y'all. <laughs>